today on the podcast, I am so pleased to welcome Susan Riley from Education Closet, which is the go-to resource for arts integration. And not only in this conversation did we talk about some tips and strategies for arts integration, but we also went into talking about how art connects us to our humanity and defines us as people. I had some goosebump moments for sure. One thing I was especially excited to talk to Susan about, many art teachers fear arts integration because they feel like it is designed to replace the art specialist. But Susan dispels this myth, and we talk about some great ways to both advocate for your program and collaborate with other teachers on your campus in meaningful ways. Let's get to it. This is Cindy Ingram, and welcome to the Art Class Curator Podcast, where we're taking art out of the dark with thoughtful explorations and in-depth interviews designed to ignite curiosity and delight in art classrooms everywhere. I am pleased to welcome Susan Riley to the Art Class Curator Podcast. Thank you for being here, Susan. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. So Susan is from Education Closet, and if you haven't checked out Education Closet, you must do so after you listen to this interview. Can you tell us a little bit more about you and your background and how Education Closet came to be? Sure. So I started out as a music teacher, K-5 music teacher, loved my job, but I hit that five-year mark and like many of us kind of decided I need a different pathway. This is starting to wear on me. You know, it was just at the start at that point, no child left behind, which ages Mm. me a lot. But (laughs) so I decided to get an admin degree. So I went back for my master's in administration because I figured if I couldn't change things as a music teacher, maybe I could change things as, as an administrator to show people more of the value of the arts in education. And during that process, I ran across arts integration as a research method. And it was really interesting. And I decided, you know what, this is what I want to do for my end of the program kind of project. And I ran it by my administrator, who was awesome. And he said, you know what, if you can get a primary educator and an intermediate educator to do it with you, run it as a pilot and see what you come up with. And I ended up getting all the team leaders in our building on board with me, which was kind of shocking, which was, it was great. We also had the special education team lead, the reading specialist. I mean, like this whole team of leaders, which I was so blessed to have. But in the midst of that, when we started it, I didn't know what I didn't know. There was very limited resources and it was very expensive. Like everything was over a thousand dollars just to get some books or something for my teachers to work off of. And so it was kind of frustrating. So we kind of did our own thing. And as we were doing it, I realized, you know what, there's not a whole lot out there and we should have a central place to document everything and to go back and check on lessons that we liked or things that didn't go well so that we can share that with the team. And that's how Ed Closet was really born. It was meant as a journal for our school as to what was going well and what didn't work and to help anybody else out there who was trying to use arts integration at the time and not knowing what they were doing, kind of like we were. Um, (laughs) And that continued that program was was great. We ended up getting an award from the Kennedy Center as an arts integration school. And Ed Closet was really a blog for the first two years, really, of just documenting. And then it started to kind of pick up speed because I, I did an article with Edutopia on what we had discovered with Common Core in arts integration. And then I got picked up as an arts integration specialist for one of the counties in the state. It was the first position of its kind. And one of the caveats of my accepting that position was that I got to keep Ed Closet. I didn't want all of my ideas to only be housed in one county system. I felt like I fed off of the ideas that other people were sharing with me. And so that was, and so it continued and it blossomed and I brought on writers and I brought on more people that I kind of learned from. That's one great thing about my team is that I learned from every single person that's on my team. Yeah. Um, They all bring great ideas. And from there, we just, you know, kind of blossomed into where we are now, which is great. Which is the go-to resource for art integration. I appreciate that. We, you know, we hit a milestone earlier this year that we have 250,000 users every single month now who wow. use the closet, which is like, it blows my mind. Every time I think about that, I'm like, are you crazy? That's awesome. <laughs> 200,000 users. That's not even like page views or whatever. That's yeah, users. That's, that's amazing. Users, which is wow. 
it's amazing to me that it's taken off to that extent that there are that many people out there who are using this. What a phenomenal thing for our kids. Yeah. And you know, as you were talking, I'm really, and you know, that number plus your story really shows that teachers want this. You know, mm-hmm. when you, you said, oh, okay, your principal said get one teacher or get two teachers total and you get all of the right. team leaders. I mean, it shows that people are hungry for this sort of education and mm-hmm. this focus on testing that's been happening in our country. Like it's sort of like a a wonderful backlash to, uh, (laughs) to all of that. So I think it's really wonderful. So these are, you know, such big buzzwords, both in, I think the education world in general, but also in our art teacher community as well with the NAA being focused on steam this year. Mm -hmm. What do you think the value is of arts integration? Well, I think First of all, it's backed by so much research and there are so many things that we could find value in. I just had a conversation about this with our certification group in that everybody, every teacher that comes to this finds their own unique value proposition to arts integration. For me, I find that arts integration provides an arts access point for all learners. I feel really strongly that every single human being on this planet has an arts access point. It could be visual art, music, theater, dance, doesn't matter. There is some pathway in for everybody. And I feel like arts integration provides us with a framework for being able to access that in our students and giving them the opportunity to use that access point to make the learning meaningful for themselves. For me, that's really powerful. And it It's not reflective of how I was taught or how my family was taught or so many others that I've seen kids that go through education that they've not been able to make that meaningful connection to something that resonates so deeply within them. And I think arts integration gives us that kind of that tool, that empowerment for our students. It also brings so much creativity back to teachers. And I think that's why, you know, you, you talked about the idea that teachers are hungry for this. Yeah, they are, because we've stripped them of any kind of creative thought, right? We give them these pacing guides that you have, they're scripted. And there was a reason behind that. I understand the reasoning behind that. You know, when I was in central office, that was something all the time. Our teachers need this because without it, they would flounder. And I always gave the pushback. How do you know that? without giving them some opportunity to be creative, to allow themselves to be a part of this process. And they're professionals, for goodness sakes. They're not robots. Like, give them the, the autonomy that yes. they deserve. And I think arts integration provides that because it's not, it's not prescriptive. You use it when it makes sense. And you can kind of craft that to make it meaningful for you and your students. And not every lesson is going to look the same depending on the kids in your room. So I think that creativity we're all hungry for. As teachers, every time I've done this with teachers, whenever time I bring it with a the staff, they, the, the amount of teachers who said, I was ready to go. I was ready to either retire or leave the profession. Yes. And this kept me here because I found mm-hmm. like I got excited again about teaching. That is super powerful to me as well. So I think there's benefits for both students and teachers, and it's just, it's a wonderful framework to be working in. Oh, wow. Yeah, you said so many things that I want to <laughs> comment on. The first one is that art, I wrote, I, you were talking, and I was like looking for paper, trying to find <laughs> somewhere to write this down. I love this art access point, because I think that's kind of where I come from, too, is, as I'm teaching teachers how to teach art appreciation and art history, because mm-hmm. Not all students are going to be artists, but they can still have art a part of their lives. So I think it's important that we give them all those access points. I really love that. Elizabeth Gilbert talks about that a little bit in her book, Big Magic. She says that, and I loved this because my parents are both farmers. Mm. They, she said, people learned, cave people learned how to create art before they learned how to feed themselves. You know, I grew up in a family where farming is a big deal because it, it is the way that we feed our families and our country and everybody. And I, but that phrase alone totally shifted it for me. It's true. Human beings are wired to create. They are wired to do this before they are even wired to feed themselves. I mean, how amazing is that? So giving us reaching back in and having our students have that opportunity to fill the well that is absolutely necessary, not optional. It is a necessary part of who we are as a human. It is so important. Chills. Chills. I love it. Because, you know, if, if it's our role to find that, find that one thing for that student, and if that student can find that one outlet, yep. that will benefit their lives 
for the rest of their lives. And, you know, if they like, they discover they love to sew or they discover they love to dance or, you know, even mix, be a DJ and mix music, you know, like any of that, if they find that one thing, oh, love mm-hmm. it. And I also love Big Magic. So if you haven't read it, listeners, make sure you go read <laughs> Big Magic. Yes. Yes. It's highly recommend. So good. I'll put uh, the links to everything we talk about in our show notes today. Mm-hmm. So other thing you talked about was yeah, giving the creativity back to the teachers because that is amazing. No one goes into teaching wanting to do worksheets. Like they go right. into teach because or they read have- a script. I mean, who wants to go into to a profession where you read a script all the time? Maybe if you're going to do the Today Show or something. <laughs> I don't know. Like, <laughs> but that's not that's not what teachers want. No. And in I best the best teaching comes from inside of you. It comes from your heart and your gut and not all teachers teach the same way. There's no way you can do a script that will work for every different teacher because we all have different personalities and that's what makes us amazing and that's what makes us connect to our students. So giving you a script is just stripping away right. what well, can make no script, no script can prepare you for every student who's in the... It's not like kids are cogs in a wheel. They're not produced on an assembly line. They all come to us with a unique flavor and unique abilities and, and a script doesn't help you with that. So... I think it has become a crutch to a certain extent. And it's a reality that a lot of teachers face is that they have to be on the pacing guide. They have to be on this page. And it is a barrier to be really frank about using arts integration. It's a scary proposition for a lot of teachers who are like, well, my administrator is going to come in and know that I'm not on page 72 of the pacing guide today because I've taken a a time to do this arts integrated lesson. I can't do that. And they feel like they have to kind of do it covertly. And the the one thing I always tell teachers is that you don't ever need permission to do what's best for kids. If an arts integrated lesson is what's best for your students at that point in time, then you're totally fine in doing it. You know, let the pacing guide be for the day. If this is what's going to make the impact and it's going to help those students finally make that learning click, do it. There's, you don't need permission for that. Just do it. (laughs) Yeah. I have a friend who teaches, she teaches ninth grade English at, you know, a highly, heavily tested grade level and subject. And yeah, if she needs to adapt or teach things in a different order, she has to get approval from the English chairperson for the whole district, not just her principal or her department head. She has to email the head person. It's just sanity. And she knows she's an amazing teacher. She knows what order everything needs to go in and she is doing what's best for her students and scaffolding for her students. It's just, a, ugh, just a travesty. Yes. So I love that we're, we're working on giving the freedom back to the teachers and, but giving them resources. So, you know, it's not scary. And, and I think it's amazing. Yes. It's amazing. Okay. So can you describe a really good arts integrated lesson or project that you have experienced in your career? Like what's a good one? Yeah, I, the trick with arts integration is to think of it like a seesaw. You want to think about a lesson sequence that is balanced and yet kind of dives into each area intentionally in and of itself, but then works together. So it's, there's a reason that people get a little intimidated by it, but a really good example for me is a lesson I did with a fifth grade teacher that connected Kandinsky with actually dance and mathematical angles and working with using protractors, particularly with fifth graders. It's not just being able to recognize acute and obtuse and right angles. It's also being able to use a protractor correctly to measure those things. Hmm. And so we actually started the lesson by taking a look at some Kandinsky pieces of artwork and having students just observe them, use simple see, think, wonder technique, that strategy of looking at the artwork. What do you see? What do you think about this? What do you wonder? And then we had them, once they've identified those things, we had them specifically look at a dance example. It was a great example out of Ohio. I need to find the link for you. But they recorded this dance that as the performers would move, the screen would light up with the angles that their bodies were creating. Uh, neat. And so you could see arcs, you could see obtuse and cute angles. And we'd had the kids watch that do the same technique, see, see, think, wonder. And then we had them really, we guided them towards looking at what kind of angles do you see here? And they identified that back in the dance. So we took it back to that Kandinsky work, that seesaw, and had them look for the angles in that Kandinsky work. And then we pulled out the protractors. And they had already learned this specific technique of how to use a protractor prior to the lesson. And that's key. You want to make sure that when you're doing an arts integrated lesson, that the key components were taught in and of themselves ahead of time. So both in the arts area and in the math content. So students had already 
had taken a look at Kandinsky work ahead of this lesson in their art class. They were familiar with Kandinsky as in a general sense. And they had also worked with, with protractors prior to this lesson. So they're really taking these two skills and processes and applying them in this lesson, which is, is key. And it goes to why arts integration doesn't replace arts instruction. So since they had had those skills, we pulled out those protractors and said, remember when you learned how to do that? Let's put it in real practice. Let's take a look at this Kandinsky work and actually write out what angles are being represented here based on these protractors. And it gave us a really good idea of can they use them? Are they being able to identify these things? Then we had these large pieces of bulletin board paper that we hung up. We took two large pieces and we created two lines. And in the line, students had to pair up. And we turned on a piece of ambient music and one partner would have to come up to the paper and create a frozen image of their body, like freeze in an angle of some sort. And the other partner had to trace that with their pencil onto the paper. And then another pair would come up and you could layer, you could do all kinds of movement. It was totally abstract. It was fun. And once they had that down, they pulled the paper down and you could see all of these weird angles that had been produced and shapes, kind of arcs, very similar to the, the original dance that we had. We then had them take a back a look at that Kandinsky print again and say, okay, now imagine that you're Kandinsky and you have these angles. How are you going to use color? How are you going to use additional shape to create this into a piece of artwork? So they then used various these markers and some pastels and lots of different arts materials to create that and look at how do you create something meaningful out of this random abstract movement <laughs> that you just did. And once they did that, then they measured the angles with their protractors that they had created. We put it back up on the wall and their team switched. So the other team that had not created the work came over and they double checked that the angles worked. They also did a peer review of what colors were used. How did this emphasize a certain area? Did the color emphasize how much movement may have been going on in a certain area? Because there were some areas where multiple angles were happening in a lot. And it was because a lot of kids used the same kind of shape in a specific area, it depended on their height. Mm -hmm. um, so had a lot of observation there. And it was a great way for us to check, do you know how to measure angles using that protractor? Are you able to look at a piece of master work and identify and observe those key components and analyze that really well? So we were looking at those very specific things and the students could assess themselves with it. It was a really powerful lesson for the students, but also for us as teachers, because we got a lot of insights into where their gaps were, some things that we didn't know some students were really great at, and the artistic pieces that they created there. It was just, it was phenomenal. I mean, you could hang that up with the Kandinsky prints, and it was so wonderful to kind of take a look and know the process that occurred there. So that's one lesson that stands out to me as a really great one for kids. I've done it multiple times, and every time, a little different. Every time the kids are so engaged and we really discover a whole lot about angles and measurement that we didn't know before, as well as Kandinsky. I mean, some of the things that kids come up with, that looks like a toothbrush. That looks like, I mean, things that you don't ever see on your own, kids will see for you. That's really awesome. That's amazing. Okay. Two questions, just very <laughs> logistical questions. When they're doing the bodies, are they tracing the shape of the body or are they just tracing like the line of the arm, the line of the So they're just tracing the lines of the arm. So if, if students, okay. they could freeze in whatever image they wanted. Some of them went down to the legs. So they use the shape of the arm down to the leg on the outside. You couldn't, of course, these are fifth graders, so you had to give them parameters. And if you do this with anybody older than fifth grade, you need to give them very specific parameters. But we always, we told them outside of the body. So the outer okay. part of the arm, the outer part of the leg. It's not like a silhouette. It's more like no. a kind of a directional art. That was part of the creative process for the partner who was tracing them because they, yeah. they could choose what to trace. They could choose to do the whole thing. They could just choose to do one angle depending on where their partner ended up. That's awesome. And can you share with us a picture yes. of one of these that I can put in the show notes? Yep, absolutely. Okay. Wonderful. That is amazing because one of the things I particularly worry about with arts integration from an art teacher's perspective mm -hmm. is that the classroom teachers are not using art content. So it's more like you're using a coloring sheet or you're just drawing a picture. And I think, you know, it's great to draw a picture, but this lesson that you described to us, they're using art content. They're using the responding and the, the critical thinking and they're, they're interpreting art and they're 
they're learning the elements and principles of art and they're, you know, they're uh, reflecting on their work. So it's, it's really deep art learning in addition to the math. So it's not that you're teaching math through art, it's you're teaching art and you're teaching math and they, they're working together instead of one being sort of subservient to the other. So yeah, that's, that's we talk about that all the time and that is a common fear and it's definitely warranted. Obviously we've all seen, you know, the shadow boxes for the planets that look really cute, but had nothing to do with the art itself, right? Or my favorite as a music teacher was teaching students 50 nifty United States to learn the 50 state names, <laughs> not arts immigration. It's, there's a continuum. So we have arts enhancement on one side of that continuum and arts integration mm-hmm. on the other. And there are spaces in between. There's theme integration, there's co-teaching that happens. And so none of it is necessarily bad. There's a place for arts enhancement. It's just, we can't use arts enhancement and call it arts integration. And that's the problem that happens sometimes. It's being, it's being clear on what that is. It's also being connected to standards. In order for it to really be arts integrated, it has to be connected to standards because those standards uphold the integrity of both content areas and one is not being used in service of the other because it can go both ways. I mean, we've seen art being used in service of a content area, but honestly, there's been a lot of times when content areas like ELA or math and science are being used in service for the art or the music lesson too. It happens both ways. So we have to be intentional about finding those standards connections and so that we maintain the integrity of both areas. And also it's really important that students have had those explicit instruction in both areas prior to ever coming to an integrated lesson. And that's why you can't, classroom teachers will never be able to replace arts teachers in an arts integrated school, quote unquote, arts integrated school, because those classroom teachers don't have the skills, the background to be able to teach the skills and processes that are needed for a successful integrated lesson. So that's why I always say arts integration actually is a better advocacy tool for arts teachers than almost anything else, because you have to have arts teacher there teaching those explicit skills and processes prior to any integrated lesson happening. Yeah, that's a good point, because I think a lot of people do fear that people who are pushing arts integration are pushing for let's get rid of the art teachers and that's just not true yeah 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 and it's it's not true arts integration that doesn't mean it doesn't happen I mean we've all seen it happen we've seen you know school boards make these kinds of cuts thinking that arts integration is going to be able to be used in place of and it's misguided so it's not that that I don't think that art teachers are against arts integration. I think they're against the misconceptions of arts integration. We got to be better at advocating for what arts integration really is and what it's not. Yeah, that's a good point. And I love the idea of that spectrum from art enhancement to art integration. And it's not Mm -hmm. that art enhancement by itself is bad. I think I agree. Like I remember the first amendment of the bill of rights because I had to Because in one of my assignments in high school, I had to write a song where I sung the Bill of Rights. And so I know the Bill of Rights, I just, I know it because I I wrote this song and I, I will never forget it. So I think that it's definitely valid. And my six-year-old is learning 50-50. That was good. Right. (laughs) Every time I mention a state, she's like, I know that state. I mean, it's really a great, it's a great, so it's definitely still needed and and good. It's just not true arts integration. it helps make things sticky, but stickiness is not necessarily deep learning. Yeah. Yes. And so we just have to understand where, where the, what your intention is for any given lesson. Yeah. I love that. Very good. So how can teacher art teachers be more of an advocate for, because you mentioned, you know, we need to be better at communicating this role. Do you have some ideas for how art teachers can advocate for, for this? Yeah. So first of all, arts teachers are always advocating for their program and that's, that comes first. We got to know the, why art is important for art's sake and arts integration doesn't replace that. So definitely we need to be advocates for arts for art's sake. But then as we're looking at arts integration and we're looking at doing these things intentionally, we also got to think about how are we sharing this intentionally? So including what standards did we hit here? What are we looking at? identifying, you know, when you have an artist statement or you're having work shown, just putting a little, you know, when you have on the tag for your students, the student work, the title, 
just include the standard number for both your artwork and maybe your ELA or math or whatever it was that you connected with if you connected with it on purpose. If it's just look at the ways that we're using all of these other standards in the art class, but you didn't actually teach an arts and integration lesson, that's also not going to, that's not going to fly as well because did you actually teach that math standard? Maybe, maybe not. So just be careful with that. But certainly if you did, put it on there, share that. Being an advocate at PTA, sharing, here's a lesson that we did in collaboration with the other teacher, or here's a lesson, here's an arts integrated lesson that I did in my classroom. Take a look at the student work here. Another great way to advocate is actually to get other teachers to participate in your gallery, in your gallery nights, in your art shows by having a teacher exhibition as well. So uh, we do a lot of student exhibitions, but you'd be amazed at how much artwork that people who are on your staff do on their own time. And we're not talking about paint nights, although that could be a place for them to start, (laughs) right? But certainly when you put it out there, a lot of them are doing things on their own that are beautiful and that should be exhibited. And so if we can highlight that, we can share that with a teacher exhibition alongside of the student exhibitions. And as you're working towards arts integration, be talking about, okay, here's how we could connect this with a lesson or an idea or a community event that we're working on. Just being intentional, it's not a lot of extra work. It's just being thoughtful about okay, we've done this in class. How can I do this in front of my community as well? How can I share that? Because people will ask questions. People will, they'll say, what standard is that? What did you do? And then that's an avenue in to say, oh yeah, we did this great lesson where I paired this math standard with my artwork and the kids just loved it. And you can then start to talk about what is this and how is it different and how do we collaborate with each other and what resources do we need? This is a great tool to have those conversations with your PTA, with your community members, those people who give more money and time to your programs. Yeah, that's amazing. I think, you know, standards are kind of, they're annoying for our teacher. Just like, yeah. But, you know, I think it's super important to make sure we're putting those up because it's, it's an easy thing you can add, just write on a sheet of paper, you know, what they're learning and then put it up there next to the art when you hang in the hall, because that is, it's just slowly kind of communicating every time a teacher walks by with their class, they're seeing that, okay, they are learning standards. So maybe next time when the classroom teacher needs this kids to finish some craft they were doing in class, she won't ask you and your teacher to come to finish it in your class because she knows that you are also teaching standards. I think just that communication is key. And I love that the gallery thing is. Yeah. That was one of the That's one of the things that I did in our building and, and uh, the teachers were like, wait, we could do that. We could share that. And I saw them, I mean, and they're not necessarily always fine art pieces. Some Mm -hmm. of them were quilts and some of the, but that alone, I mean, the, the integrity that they work on that, the pride that they had coming into that and then learning how to to use some of that in their own classrooms, because when they contribute it, then they want to know, how do I use this with my kids? And that's the other thing about that standards piece is that I guarantee you, if a classroom teacher walks by and they see a standard that they're teaching, they're going to want to know, what did you do, right? Because they <laughs> feel as much ownership over that as we do about our art content, right? So they're going to initiate a conversation of, what do you mean with this standard? What did you do? And get curious about it. There's a whole other side segment there on, on using your art supplies and, <laughs> and <laughs> having them finish things in your classroom, that there's oh. a whole boundaries thing that we could get into <laughs> on establishing <laughs> those kinds of working parameters and boundaries. But just suffice it to say, it's important that we have that, those boundaries set and we're respectful with them, but that we also don't shut ourselves off. We have mm-hmm. that seesaw of yes and no, right? So it can't always be one or the other, but having that established is important too. Yeah. And I think it's very important, you know, our teachers can get very defensive when it comes to the way classroom teachers approach them about collaboration. But I think, you know, having that collaboration is so key and so important. So if, if you're open to it and you're communicative and you do have those boundaries, then you can create really meaningful learning experiences, but you it's communicating to the classroom teacher the value of what you're doing and you just have to show it. And it feels weird to constantly having to prove ourselves and show ourselves, but that's, 
kind of the nature of what you're in. Yeah, it's from this role, it's really interesting for me because we provide supports to both classroom teachers and arts teachers and administrators. So I get to see all three dynamics at work. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting because each group has their own set of things that are kind of like, I want to, I feel like I have to prove myself. Like our teachers always feel like they have to prove that they're, they're worth it, that they're valued in that building. And I always tell our teachers, you are intrinsically worth it. Like we started our conversation about this idea that we as human beings, <laughs> this is how we manifest our being in the world is through art. So you are intrinsically worth it. Classroom teachers have a different perspective. They feel like they're constantly overwhelmed and nobody understands that they're, they're kind of overwhelmed like mm. another classroom teacher. And I always have to point out, do you ever have to do a gallery night? Do you ever have to do a spring arts performance? No. So yes, you have testing that you have to do, but is it in front of the entire school community? No. <laughs> so there's a whole other dynamic. It's learning yeah. how to, it's all about learning how to be respectful of each other, how to have conversations that value each other's content area and know that we're all working for the best benefit of kids. There's one thing that peeves me is that it's, that's not my job. It's always our yeah. job. Tying shoes, is always going to be my job if that is a child that needs it, right? <laughs> yeah. Listening to a child that had a really rough day getting out the door is always going to be my job. You know, it's yeah. the same thing if a child doesn't know how to hold a crayon. It's always going to be my job, whether I'm the art teacher or the classroom teacher. It's, it's all of our job all the time. And that's where the heart of collaboration comes in, I think. Oh, I love that. Yeah, if you, yeah, I, you know, and even it, this is kind of straying off of arts integration, but even, you know, as an elementary art teacher, when you have a bunch of different classes and, you know, you can always tell the personality of the class by which teacher they have. And, you know, some <laughs> of them are more rowdy and some of them are more calm and you're like, oh, well, it's that person's class. No wonder. But I think it's the same thing that you can, an art teacher can say, oh, okay, well, it's not my job to really control this class because they don't have control the rest of the time, you know, but it's, I love that. It's just, yeah, it is. Yes, it is. It's your job to, to take care of those kids no matter what. So I, I really love that. Okay. Not art really. <laughs> <laughs> but it kind of is because you yeah. have to learn if that's true, if that statement is true, that it's always all of our jobs, then I'm going to want to learn what you know in order to support that child in my class. And you're mm -hmm. going to want to learn what I help them with in my class so that you can do the same in yours. And that builds that value and that worth that collaboration between teachers. Yeah, I love that. The, the last school I was at was a small charter school. And we had very strong communication among all the different teachers. And so I felt like I knew all of those kids and all of their struggles so well because I had information about how they were doing in math and I had information about how they were doing in, in English. And, you know, when, when they had a behavior issue in science that day, I knew about it. So by yeah. the time they came to my class, I was ready and I was prepared for, you know, whatever had happened that morning. So, so it was a little overkill with the communication. <laughs> because you're like, I'm trying to teach here, but it was so, yeah, it was so valuable. And, and that led to conversations about, well, how can we inter integrate our curriculum too to make sure that, that we're having something meaningful? So like when the history teacher was teaching World War I, he was like, well, what can I bring in about World War I? And I was like, mm -hmm. well, we're going to do Dada art, which was sparked by World War I. So that's perfect. We can do that at the same time. And so we collaborate that way. So it wasn't necessarily arts integration, but we're both covering sort of the same topics at the same time. Yeah, time period. And that was really beneficial for the students to see how, you know, the, the world is interconnected and yeah. not divided into subjects, you know? Oh, absolutely. And that's, that falls right that center of continuum. That's theme-based integration where you're working on that same theme or topic. But I always tell when we're talking about integration and why should we use integration and why should when you, when students leave your, your classroom or go outside the school building and they look at the world outside of them, they don't look at the sky and say, that's the color blue, that's art. There's a tree, that's science. Nothing is compartmentalized. Everything is intertwined for us, especially now, especially with all of the technology that we have and the way that we can connect with the world. The world has become much smaller and much bigger at the same time. And everything is connected. 
So why in the world would we ever always stick with separating subjects? Sometimes you have to, but providing Mm -hmm. opportunities to put that together, why wouldn't you? That's the bigger question. Instead of why arts integration, why wouldn't you? Yeah. Oh, that is an excellent point. And I think that's an excellent sort of ending point. I feel like I could talk to you for another three hours, (laughs) but (laughs) I read a podcast, I read a podcasting thing the other day and it said, if you leave it wanting to keep talking, that's probably a good place to stop because it keeps your mind going, keeps your mind thinking. So I think that's perfect. Good. So, So can you tell us just a final last few questions? How can teachers connect with you online and what sort of resources are you offering with Education Closet? So you can find me online. You can go to our website at educationcloset.com. We also have a Facebook page that we're really active on and I'm also very active on Twitter. My personal Twitter account is Susan Riley Photo. So I'll make sure I send that over to you. Short conversations. I'm quick on Twitter with that. Education Closet right now, we about 80% of our resources are absolutely free for teachers. Please go use them. We have downloads that you can print off. We have an arts integration placemat that you can put out for students as a reference guide. I mean, there's just, there's so many. We have a free magazine every month that comes out. So definitely check out all of those free resources. We also are doing a a summer online conference. I know, Cindy, you participated in our winter one. We have a summer online conference coming out in July. It's open for registrations now. And also we do a lot of online classes for PD credit and a certification program. So we we have a lot going on over at the site right now. That's awesome. Yeah, definitely check out their resources because they are just so useful and not just, I mean, just as an art teacher, you'll, you will certainly find them valuable. So, and in my last question, which I ask everybody is what artwork changed your life? Okay. So I thought about this a lot because remember I started as a music teacher. So thinking about a piece of music is much easier for me than thinking about a piece of artwork. But actually, there is a piece of artwork called Days Gone By from Ben Ham. He is a modern artist. He's a photographer who studied a lot with, with or a lot of artwork that is based in photography, Ansel Adams, that kind of feel. But I was, he's based out of Charleston, South Carolina. When I was there this past fall, I walked by his gallery with my husband. We were on an anniversary trip. And it was the first time that I had ever looked at a piece of artwork in a window as I was walking by and turned around and went back into the gallery because I couldn't leave it. I oh. couldn't stop that. He uses long, is it long range cameras? That huge film that comes out on a piece of glass and it looks like it's a painting, but it's actually a photo. So you have to look at it for a really long time to kind of see all the details and everything, everything, every piece of artwork in that gallery, I would have bought if I could. I ended up spending, it was the first piece of original artwork that I ever bought that hangs now in my living room. And every time Uh I look at it, I still stop. I still stop and look at it. It has changed the way that I look at a piece of artwork for almost everything else that I look at now. So I love Ben Ham's work. I love that piece. I think that's the one for me. I love it. Yeah. When you, a lot of these stories always start with, you know, I was just walking by and all of a sudden I just got socked in the face, you know, like yeah. and mine was a punch in the gut. I mean, you know, my, my art store, favorite art story. And it's just, you can't look away and you have to keep looking. You, you cannot pull yourself away. And I love that story. I, I pulled it up as you were talking and it's beautiful and it almost looks like a drawing too. So it's like painting or a drawing or a photo. It's kind of hard to tell. We'll put a link to it in the show notes. So you Fantastic. So what piece of music changed your life? So that would be Nimrod Symphony Number no. 9 from Elgar. Literally within the first two notes of the piece, it's like my entire body suddenly calms down. It's, mm. it's as if somebody gave me a drug and my body went slack. I can't listen to it while I drive. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, and it's not traditional. I actually had it played as a prelude for my wedding. Everybody kind of thought that was weird and I, that's okay. But for me... <laughs> a way for me to calm my nerves, <laughs> but also to remember my connection. It's for whatever reason, when that music comes on, just like that piece stays gone by. Like when I look at it, I get the same feeling that I am part of something much bigger than maybe my own little world and myself. Yeah. And I love living in that space as much as I can. So Me too. That's so beautifully put because that's how I feel too about music and about art. Just you can just get lost in it and you feel connected to someone else who made it, but also just to humanity as a whole. Yeah. And I have some songs like that too, where I like, you would think I would hear the song like after hearing it 600 times that it wouldn't make me cry, but there are some songs that make me cry every single time. Like the one song glory from rent. I cry Mm -hmm. 
every single time I hear that song. And it's just, well, if I'm like actually like really listening to it, if it's just playing in the background, I probably wouldn't. But, yeah. you know, it's just art is part of us. And I love that emotional response that we get. It just proves that it's just an inherent thing, like you were saying at the beginning that, you know, cave people and, you know, they probably were, I'm sure, created music before they created, before they knew how to feed themselves too. It's right. just a natural <laughs> thing. I love it. All right. Well, thank you so much. This has been really enlightening for me and really interesting. And I'm, I'll be thinking about all of this for the rest of the day. So that's fabulous. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. This has been a true joy in my day today. Thank you. Okay. There you have it. That was Susan Riley from Education Closet. And I just loved how beautifully Susan spoke about the power of art in our lives and how art connects us with our humanity. It really is everything I love about art. She spoke about this so eloquently, and I'm so happy that she was able to talk with us today. As Susan mentioned, Education Closet does have an online conference, which is coming up on July 19th. And if you register before July 2nd, you get the $25 off early bird pricing. So check that out at artsintegrationconference.com. Thanks again to Susan, and I will see you guys next time. Thank you so much for listening. If you like what you hear, please subscribe and give us an honest rating on iTunes. This will help other teachers find us and hear these amazing stories. Do you want even more art inspiration? Sign up for Art Class Curator's once a week email newsletter, your weekly art break. Teacher Sarah Warnock says, I truly do take a break from my busy week to check out all your links and feel inspired. Everything you share is relevant, meaningful, and also super helpful. You definitely help me become a better art teacher, and I look forward to your emails each week. You can sign up at artclasscurator.com slash art break. And as a free gift for subscribing, you'll get six free art interpretation worksheets to use in your classroom. Be sure to tune in next week for more inspiring art interviews. You've got to connect with that kid. And if you can get them to even be a little bit vulnerable with you, then you're in, you know, you're in like Flynn. And so that, that would be my you know, recommendation. And, and those, are the, those are the kids that need it most, for sure, you know. Everybody has that tenderness inside. You just got to peel it back a little bit somehow.